welcome again and welcome uh, Jean-Philippe from Montreal tonight. Thank you. Uh, and Jean-Philippe will draw a very interesting topic and he's an expert in that topic, which is even better, um, which is <laughs> which is automation in the cloud, which is a yeah, an interesting topic, especially if you look at the differences between on-premise automation and cloud automation. And I guess quite a few of you have questions. How does that work? Can we migrate from one to the other? Are there things we can do on-premise that we cannot do in the cloud? And Jean-Philippe is willing and able to answer all those questions. And with that, Jean-Philippe, over to you. And I will just disappear and see you on oh, the wow. other side. So. All right. Thank you. That was a great setup. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. I'm JP. I'm going to just share my screen. Jean-Philippe is actually the right way to say it, but I usually have to say JP because in English, not everybody's good with Jean-Philippe. I have Jean Felipe and stuff like that. So welcome to uh, our little presentation today about automation in the clouds. Of course, uh, um, we're kind of, you know, we're, I'm from Adaptivist. We're kind of known for that. Uh, automation, of course, with Script Runner, but I'm Jean-Philippe Comon. I'm a customer success advocate here at Adaptivist. Um, and um, I, you know, what I do is I basically help our customers integrate, you know, with tools and different things that, that they're doing, it, not only with the Atlassian ecosystem, but anything that we do at Adaptivist with Slack and GitLab now and everything. Um, but other than that, I, I try to meet the community as much as I can. I used to be an ACE leader myself in Montreal, where I'm actually based out of. So I'm, I'm coming at you from Canada, where it's right now cold, snowy, and um, yeah, just generally gray out there. But um, yeah, so that's what I do. Uh, here are a little like top three things uh, to know about me. I'm a new dad. So that's that's completely new for me. It's been 10 months now. So if ever you hear a loud bang, or you know, crying or things. I apologize, but it's the reality I'm in now. Um, I love Curryverse, like I I just love it. I really do. I was in in uh, Berlin about three three years ago, so uh, that's like the main thing for me. And I I really want it more in my life. I just I can't find it in Canada. So if you want to send me a care package, I'm always open to that. Um, but let's look at the agenda. So today we're going to be, I, I want to do a quick intro of automation in Atlassian. Um, let's look at what, you know, automation on premise means, what automation in the cloud means, and then we'll look into more specifically kind of the script runner differences. But so let's start with kind of an intro on, you know, automation in the Atlassian ecosystem. So we've all seen this picture, right? Um, maybe not this one specifically, but kind of something similar. It looks like it's coming from the the, the early 1900s, uh, you know, of, of just a bunch of people doing the same thing over and over again. And we we waste a lot of time doing simple things, repetitive things, boring things. And, and automation was always this idea of striving for more efficiency and, and cutting down on these things. Um, it's now an integral part of work and what we do. We automate things to make sure that people are giving attention to what brings value instead of just wasting time on tasks that don't actually bring value. And to quote, you know, Amber Rudd, um, automation is driving the decline of banal and repetitive tasks. This, this to me is like kind of how it all started, right? The idea was to stop doing things that just happen every day and start doing creative things. Um, it's, and then creativity is, is a big part of it. And that's what kind of automation brings to the table for the Atlassian ecosystem. So we've been, you know, automating um, in Jira since about 2007. And uh, we've seen that growth kind of happen to all Atlassian products uh, since then. The automation tools, and, and some may actually say the, the entire marketplace of apps is actually integral and, and kind of a differentiator in the market for Atlassian products. But let's look at how automation actually affects your instances. So first there's kind of the instance wide automation, which, you know, you're, you're thinking of like listeners in script runner for events and things that are happening, anything that reaches multiple projects. And that's kind of independent of workflows. Um, you can modify the look and feel of the application. You know, when you think of, of, of script fragments and integrations that we usually do in the announcement banner, I know I used to inject a lot of HTML and CSS in there. Um, you can use, you know, automation to implement uh, some type of government governance uh, over your instance, you know, and, and some type of best practice for your organization, what it means to be, you know, in, in SAP's shoes, for example, uh, as we're using this example. 
Um, so let's say in your org, you want tickets to always be the same way. So that's, that's outside of just a workflow. That's kind of instance wide. Then you have, of course, the workflow specific automation. And, and those are the most commonly and widely used. That's what your typical automation tool outside of just script runner. But, you know, if we're, if we're looking at JMWE and JSU and all these different tools, that's what they, they mostly focus on is post functions automations. So these, these are, uh, you know, your typical, um, if field equals this, then do that. If, you know, uh, this, this due date selected, then do that. Um, these are the kind of things that are usually triggered by a, uh, transition from one status to the other. So these are kind of your, your classic. And then of course the one-time automation. So I'm thinking of the, not just the console, but kind of anything that fixes an issue that you're experiencing right now. Um, you know, if you need to massive bulk update things, but it has to integrate some logic, for example. So when we do a bulk edit, right, you'll, you'll select a bunch of issues and you'll do, all right, this field needs to become that. But what if you have, you know, different logic behind it? So if this field equals that, then I want this field to equal that. That's when you'd use like the console and things like that to modify those issues. So these are kind of different type of automations that we're used to. And we know it's important. And that's what you get in on-premise, right? And in order to kind of compare what it means to automate on-premise and cloud, we have to start at the what everybody knows right now. And that's on-premise and what it looks like. Fundamentally, when you're building an app, you know, we get to use the engine that runs the platform. That means that we get access to the Java code, we get access to the database, we have access to the HTML, HTML and CSS building the UI of the app. And so this translates into different things. First of all, we can run the code as many times as we want because we're actually using Atlassian's engine. So we don't need to worry about, you know, overloading what we, you do need to overload, worry about overloading the system when you're building loops and stuff like that. Um, but if you're just pinging, you know, the actual system, you don't have to worry about how many times you're pinging it unless you're going into the thousands to millions, uh, right? If you go into the millions, which I've done once in my past, but I did it on a development instance. So that's good practice. Uh, as long as you do it on a dev instance, uh, you're fine, but um, there's no kind of limit to what you can do. One of the things that you can do on premise that we're kind of used to is you can create rest endpoints. And why do I want to talk about them is because rest endpoint creation is kind of what powers a lot of the things that you're used to in script runner. So we're thinking of, you know, behaviors and stuff like that. Um, using rest endpoints, we can actually expose right points that are not part of the written API. So I'll go into APIs and what it means in the cloud and all that later on. Uh, so if you're not sure what I'm talking about, that's fine. I'll explain it more later. But if you do not understand what I'm saying, you know how integral, you know, it can be to be able to, to create new REST endpoints, not just for whatever you're doing right now. So meaning that again, behaviors, but if you're interacting with Confluence and Jira or from any system outside of Jira, creating those REST endpoints is very important because we own the system. It's your system. You can actually create those REST endpoints. And again, since we have access to that code, the underlying code, we can actually inject stuff into the interface. So that means we can interact with, you know, the HTML, CSS of the page when the DOM, you know, some would say, um, if you know what that is, but basically you can modify it. So that's where like script fragments come in, but also, like I said, the classic, you know, let's put some stuff in the banner. And then, you know, um, using all the methods above, you know, the dynamic interactions. So again, behaviors and all that. So these are things you can expect on premise, but you know, as Bob Dylan famously said, the times, they are a changing and we're now moving into the cloud era. And that changed the mentality of us when we were, and when I say us, I do mean adaptivists, but any app vendor that was creating automation needed to rethink how they were doing it. The question was kind of simple. How do I take advantage of the flexibility and scalability of the cloud? But at the same time, I keep the power, the same power that you're accustomed to as a customer on server or data center. And the main difference between the two is how we can build apps for the two environments. As I mentioned before, you know, we have access to the underlying platform when you're working on premise, but this is completely different to what the reality is in the cloud. When you install an app 
on cloud, we only get access as a vendor when, when we're creating that app to what Atlassian wants us to have access to. And I'll, I'll use like an analogy that I really, I've used a couple of times, which is let's use, let's talk about owning versus renting space. So I have, I actually have this argument weekly these days with my friends that are coming out of school, uh, tell me I'm a sellout because I live in the suburbs of Montreal now. I have, you know, I, I bought a house. I'm outside, I'm outside the city uh, and they all live in apartments that they rent, right? And there's no right or wrong answer, but you have to look at the two sides of the coin. And it's, it's very reflective of what it's like to have an on-premise instance versus a cloud instance. When you own a house or you own an apartment, uh, an apartment, um, you can tear down the walls, right? You can work on different things around the house. You can decide what you want in the house, how you want the walls to look, uh, you know, who you want to, you know, let into your apartment if you want even. Um, but it's, it's your place. You do what you want with it, right? You have access to the pipes, to everything underneath. And that's the same for on-premise. When you're on-premise, you own the whole system, the application from end to end. When that that's the good part the bad part is you also get you know disadvantages which is it's your house now so if something's broken you gotta fix it because you're not renting this space it's yours if my pipes are broken they're my pipes so i gotta fix them i'm in charge of maintenance and i'm i have to pay taxes like it's expensive to keep maintaining that place if i'm renting however i am paying a premium to rent the place i'm not you know i'm paying sometimes even more money than a mortgage would be, but I don't have to worry about taxes. Don't have to worry about maintenance. You just call the landlord. They can come in, fix it. I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, sometimes electricity is in. So I don't even need to worry about the lights being on, but you know, I don't own the place. It's not my place. I don't have, I can't just decide. I don't want this wall anymore. And I, I, I want to change all the pipes and I want to make sure that the air conditioning is installed and all that. It's not my place. And I have to ask permission. And it's the same thing in the cloud. You don't have to worry about any overhead anymore. It's done. You're, you don't have to do that. But you, do, you are paying a premium for that, that privilege. But at the same time, you, know, you don't really own the space. You don't really own the cloud instance that you're on. You're, on. you're renting it from Atlassian. And they decide kind of what you have access to or not. And again, I don't think there's one solution that's better than the other. I think they're both super valid and, and you have to explore what's better for your organization. But kind of use that analogy and understand kind of autom how to automation works. Instead of using the engine behind Atlassian, think of like the managers, right? If you're writing code for Script Runner, you're using issue managers and all that. Now we have to interact with whatever is exposed by Atlassian via their API. So as you know, or maybe you don't, APIs are basically like a mailing system. Uh, it, it's kind of like, you know, going to the, the, the post and like, all right, I have information I request, so I need to know something. So I'll send a letter asking for that information. And the recipient of that letter will decide based on who I am and if I have access to that information or not, if they want to send that information back. And if they do, they will then send me a package with all the relevant information I asked for. If I want to send information to the recipient, I want to say, hey, I need to update this. I'll send a box to them and they decide if they want to open it or not. And if they do, they'll let me know that they opened it and they, you know, changed the information or not. If they decide not to, then, you know, they'll, they'll pack it back up and basically tell me, yeah, I don't want that box. So it, it's a little complicated to ex explain in more details. And now I'll show you live examples of what it's like. But this is kind of the difference between the two. So if you look at on-premise, you know, um, all the listings, the things that I've listed before, and if you look on cloud automations, you'll see some of the differences there. So limited executions, why do we need, we say that is because now we don't have access to the system itself. We have to ask permission every time we do something. So that means that I can't just, uh, you know, send thousands and thousands of requests a second and just expect everything to run, run us smoothly. You can't really create REST endpoints anymore because we don't have access to the underlying API because you're not owning the product anymore. It's a static interface because we can't play with the HTML, CSS the way we used to. What you'll notice a lot of the times if you're looking at apps that change the look and feel of Confluence, for example, you'll notice that they create a new web page entirely grab the information because an API is available to grab the information from Confluence 
and they'll throw it on a brand new web page. But that means that you're hosted somewhere else. You know, it creates its own set of problems. Maybe you're okay with those problems, those security issues. Maybe you're not. And you have, of course, limited interactions with the system itself. So the dynamic interactions are not available the same way they used to be. Now, automations for JIRA is what is bundled into JIRA right now. Uh, there are different types of service of, a, of, of uh, automation and they're all based on your user tier, okay? So going back to kind of cloud versus on-premise, you don't get automations for JIRA bundled into your on-premise application. Um, but the way that it works is you have different tiers. But there are some advantages to using just the JIRA automations that you already have access to because they're integrated, right? A tool is really good for basic automations. If all you're looking for is to update a field or simply like modify an assignee or something, you should look into what you already have if you have a standard to enterprise plan. Now, there are some downsides. There's limited execution and they're all based on your cloud tier. So, um, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me. If I remember correctly, it's 2000 executions per user per month on the premium plan. It's a pool of, of execution. So that means even if they say it's 2000 per user, it's actually, let's say you have a hundred users, it's, uh, it's gonna be 200,000 ex executions every month that you can do, not based on the user, but that's how they calculate the number. Um, but that's kind of the downside. And of course, I mean, automations is not the same, but there are other tools that you can use to create more powerful automations, you know, tools like PowerScript, or, or JMWE or JSU that are available on cloud that can give you all the workflow power that you need without a maximum number of executions. So that means that you're kind of bypassing that, hey, that, that limit. So if you have users that, you know, or bots, it could be even bots that, um, you know, always update tickets and stuff like that. Um, those are, are not limited in that capacity. Um, they're still limited by the underlying aspect of the API, which means you can't just do hundreds and hundreds of calls a minute or a second, but that's how they work. And of course, you know, I, I have to talk about script running for Jira cloud because it's, it's, you know, our bread and butter. But um, if you're looking at something that are, that's maybe more outside the box, not just workflows, you know, script runner for Jira cloud is of course uh, available. Um, but here's what we really want to dive into. And, and let's go into a live demo of, of the two tools kind of script runner for Jira cloud versus script runner for Jira on premise. So let's look at, um, this is on-premise, but let's look at Script Runner for Jira Cloud and what it looks like. So this is your opening page and what you'll get is, you know, you'll get your browser um, and, and kind of everything that you can do inside of Script Runner for Jira Cloud. Some of the differences that you'll notice is we have, uh, you know, we actually have a, a lot of things, but um, if you wanna look at searches and all that, they're kind of built differently. So the keyword sync. So we have some things that are different that I don't want really necessarily want to dive into right now. I really want to go high level into scripting, but there are some differences between um, kind of how you do searches in Script Runner, uh, cloud versus Script Runner on premise. The script fragments are not going to work the exact same way again because it depends on what we have access to inside the UI and what we don't. But let's look really at at kind of the, the the script consoles and let's let's run some scripts and see the differences between the two options that we have. Um, and and actually, before I go into that, if you're new uh, to Script Runner for Jira Cloud and you want to see kind of the differences, um, one of the good things to look at is this the Adaptivist library. Um, so if you go into library.adaptivist.com. Um, you'll notice we have a lot of resources for you to just look at and at a high level of research, it's actually really good uh, to just go in and like type whatever you're trying to do. Um, and from there, you know, you'll get options and things. So update the value of a custom field using a listener. If you want to understand that um, we have some code there for you, data center server, and you can kind of update that. So these are the different things, but if we look at more generic stuff, um, let me try to find, this page actually. So if we go with this page, this is update the, val the value of a custom field through the script console, we'll have the server code and we'll have the cloud code for you to look at. So let's look into that and kind of notice the differences. So this is a script console on premise. Okay, this is on premise what we're looking at right now. 
So on premise, we all know what managers are, right? Managers, or maybe you don't, but basically managers are the way that we access the information that we need. I see them as, you know, just, just kind of um, the middleman between the system and us. So, Hey, I'm going to need to access some information on the issues. So I'm going to need an issue manager. I need to interact with some custom fields. I need a custom field manager. So what I have here is a really simple code that runs that basically I have an issue key here. I have a custom field name. I'm going to ask the issue manager to get an issue based on the issue key I have, which is EA22. And then I'm going to ask that another manager, the custom field manager to, and I'm, I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see that. I hope you can see it. We have our code here. It's quite simple. So like I said, I have an issue. I get the issue. Then I get the custom field. I have the custom field objects. Uh, whenever I have a custom field objects, I have to tell it what issue I want it to grab on because you can have the company custom field here is on multiple issues. So which issues are we looking for? And then that's the custom field is, is name. And then I ask it to get the value from the issue for that custom field. It's as simple as that. And now I can actually zoom out or I go back. And if I run this, it's already kind of here, but um, if I run it on, you know, another issue. So let's see if I can't do it on, um, you know, anything E15 for, it's all the same. Let me just find an issue with a different company attached to it. <laughs> I built a lot of examples with Wells Fargo, it seems. Uh, I'm just trying to make it run. Okay, so let me just change the value here to another thing. So let's do that. EA29 is the issue code. So EA29, if I run it, bam, I have the value of the custom field here. So it's 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 actually quite straightforward. I know a lot of you are used to doing that. That's, that's what it used to look like. Now let's go into Script Runner for jira cloud and kind of want to do the same thing so we're going to try to get the value of a custom field for an issue and we'll notice the difference right away so inside of the script console in J uh, script runner for jira cloud you actually have access to a bunch of examples i highly encourage you to use that example uh, because it can just get you started but what you'll notice right away is and let's say i want to get issue fields um what you'll notice right away is it's different. <laughs> we're not using managers anymore. We're using the API. So what we're doing is we're asking the API for stuff, right? Mailman, the mailman thing. So I'm going to be asking, hey, I have this issue key. I'd like to get all the fields in this issue. And I want the specific field from that issue. So I'm going to need an issue key. And I'm going to do what we call a rest call. Okay, so you got get and put. I'm not going to go into in detail into how that works. But basically I'm gonna say, hey, I need to get something. I don't need to put anything there. I need to get something. I need to get an issue based on this issue key. And then what it's gonna do is it's gonna either return me if the status is 200, it's gonna say 200 means, yes, I work. Remember I told you there's a response to whatever you get. So it's sending a code back. Hey, 200 is good. 401 may mean, hey, I don't know what you're trying to ask me. So that would be a bad uh, call. So let's just run this to get us started. And you'll see why I really encourage you to start working with the script console at first. That's how I learned script runner for Jira Cloud. And I highly recommend you do that. If you look into the console, and I'm gonna zoom into the code when, when we get in there, but um, hopefully you can see kind of what I'm getting back. And that is what we call a JSON, okay? So we received a JSON package full of information on the issue, full of information. Now. What we're asking for is the value of a custom field, right? So you'll notice that within this, there's a bunch of custom field calls, okay? These are actually all the custom fields available to an issue. Null means that that custom field is empty. If I have a value, it means that there's a value selected. In this case, these are the values that I have selected based on the custom field. So for, to give you a clear example, let me, um, let me get that issue for you so that you can see it. So if I go here, you'll notice that I have home office supplies, which is a multi-select field. And I have office supply, which is a single select field. Okay. So let's do that so that we kind of get different answers. Basically the, the, the multi-select is going to return me two values. 
the office supply is going to return me one value in the JSON. So if I look here in the custom field 10, the 10,031, it returns me two values. And this is where it gets tricky, okay? These, these are kind of nested, all right? It's kind of looking at an XML file if you want without the indentation, which I really like in XML files. But um, this is what you're looking at. So chair monitor. So let's say we're looking for the value of custom field 10,032, okay? So if we do that, right, we have this return here, okay? And I'm going to I'm going to remove this to kind of make it easier and we're going to zoom into the code a little bit. So let's do Apple Plus. Yeah. All right. So all we're going to ask for is a return, okay? Now uh let's do that. Okay. So as you can see right now, the return is result.body.fields, okay? Think of it as if you're navigating let's say any file, but basically what we're doing is we're going into the nested things. So in this one, we're doing result. And then the result is the entire thing. The body is without the headers. And I'm not going to go into what it is, but basically the body is what you're looking for. And then if we're asking for fields, it's going to give me information on fields. So if we go, if we go a level higher or deeper, we'd want to get custom field 10, 0, 32, right? That's what it seemed like. If I went here and I look for the custom field, custom field 1032. So as you can see, this is kind of the higher level. And then underneath that, you have self, value, and ID. These are, are variables, but basically that's what they are. So technically, right, if I run this, I should be able to get everything nested on there. Yes, that's what I get. So if I do custom field at 10, 10, 0, 32, I get all this information. Now I want to get monitor. That's the value I'm looking for. So I do dot value. That's where I get monitor. So that's kind of how you're going to interact when you're building post functions and stuff is, hey, I want the value of this. So I need to do results that body dot fields dot custom field dot value. So yeah, this is kind of what it looks like. And now you can map this out to whatever automation that you're doing. Now, remember, this is still groovy code. So all your if loops, your, you know, your logic, your else's, everything is going to work. Fours, this is all going to work, okay? But whenever you're moving data from on-premise to cloud, remember that in, in its score, all the managers are not going to be working anymore. You have to work with REST APIs now. So that means that whatever you're looking for, you got to do it that way. And to give you one last thing before we jump into the Q&A session, this is really specific to, I want an issue key, but let's say you want to work with users in the API, right? You can do users Jira API. And if you do that, you'll get to the developer platform. And this is the API documentation. Whereas maybe you're used to uh, the Java API for Jira, which is what we used to use on premise. Now you have access to all these calls. And these is, again, look, if I wanna get users, this is what I need to do. I need to get user. And because we're doing that, um, you know, we're doing it this way, this is the new documentation you wanna be looking for. All this is gonna tell you like, hey, you wanna create a user, this is how you do. This is, you're going to have to post or put um, a, 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 you know, information and you're going to create that user. You want to delete a user, same thing, bulk, get users. This is what you need. These are the parameters that you need, you need. There's a lot of documentation out there. I recommend the community a ton because there's a lot on community and there's a lot um, on the library as well. So if you want to look into that, please do so. Um, in order to not make this completely technical, I guess I'm going to stop there, but uh, hopefully you find this very useful in kind of understanding how this migration to cloud would work. And I guess if you have any specific questions, um, I guess we're, we're, I'm ready to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much. And while I promote everybody to the panel, uh, let me start you off with the questions. Are there any tools that help me with migration? I don't know, a debugger, uh, a translator, whatever you want to call it. So uh, we're, we're always working on new things to help migration. But right now, to be honest, there's nothing much out there uh, okay. because of the nature of coding, right? It's so, it's so um, 
it's not really objective. It's kind of subjective. It depends on what you do. So automating that is not easy. We're working on everything we can to make this this move easier. So believe me when I say that in the back, in the, in the behind the scenes, we're doing a lot. But right now, as of today, it's a very manual process. Uh, okay. So, but because I'm switching from managers to REST API, I basically have to touch every script uh, and yes. do a search select it's, exchange. Yeah, there are different thingy. ways. I mean, yeah, Whatever. I've seen people yeah. do it in the database itself. Uh, going into yeah. the database to change the values, you can do that. Uh, it's tricky, <laughs> but it's 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 a process. I, I I can't lie. Like it's a it's a process. Yeah, but you but you can't get access to the database in the cloud anyway. So yeah, exactly. What I mean what I mean the... is you can do it on premise. You could go actually in a database to modify the code, which I've seen doing the selects and replace. Okay. It's not fun. It's not fun at all, and it's no. open to errors and anything. I've seen people do it, but. Yeah, um, so it's it's manual and um, okay, and that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I can't lie, like it is. Yeah, it's a lot of, work. of course. And and we all know that migrations from from on premise to cloud right now, the real bulk of the work is your apps, whatever you're doing with apps. So it's not even just script runner. It's going to be tempo. It's going to be you know anything yeah. that you're doing is going to be tricky when you move. Exactly. Um, and and because you are using that every day, I guess. Uh, what are your experiences with the, let's say, stability of the REST API in the cloud? Is it changing very often? Is that still work in progress? Is that stable? Is it? It's somewhat stable, to be honest. There's a lot of yeah. experimental stuff happening right now, so they're trying to input a lot more creation. So, uh, the API, right? Remember back when it was wasn't in the cloud, um, they didn't need to uh, put a lot of posts in there. There weren't as many, hey, you can now do, you can now create this, you can now create that. Uh, it was a lot more about getting information. Everybody wanted to create bots and stuff that would just, hey, I need a report on this. Let me just create something. I'll ping the REST API. I'll grab it. Now they're building more and more, create this, create that, bulk, create this. Um, and it's it's tricky. So for example, the users, I, I, I encountered this about three weeks ago as I was building a demo like this. Um, if you want to get users, you used to just be able to ping, you know, your script runner, you know, on premise, just like, Hey, give me all the users that do that. Or even just like, give me a number of the amount of users. But now that we're in the cloud with GDPR and everything happening in Europe, but also just in general, there are a lot of permissions around what you can and can't access about on a user. So what used to be super easy, cause you had the database, you could access your AD, you could access everything is now kind of complicated because it's not you that decide what's and what you want to access. It's Lassian that says, oh yeah. And when you do, you expose it to the world. It's not behind a firewall or anything. So if you decide, I mean, there are security tokens and everything. I'm not saying it's completely out in the open, but you expose risk because you're doing it through a REST API. So for example, I wanted to get, I wanted to create a simple script that would just run every week and send emails to the user saying, you're now at 1,300 users. I can't actually build that script in the cloud. It's impossible. I do not have the permission as a user, regardless of which user I use to do that, that script, I don't have the permission to go and see the number of users that are active on the instance. It's, it's blocked by Atlassian. So they're experimenting with it. I know it's ex they, they, on the, um, if you look at the API uh, documentation I showed, mm -hmm. you'll notice some of them are experimental and that tells that it's unstable. Like you said, right in the beginning, some of them are going to be unstable. Um, so they're trying to do things to allow access, but it's difficult right now okay. for some of these things. We have two questions in the chat. When mm -hmm. will there be Git integrations? Speaking of syncing a repo into Jira. Okay, so I've, I've actually seen people do it outside of Script Runner. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm going off of what I think the question is. So let me know if that's not it. But um, I've seen people basically put the file on the server and then, oh, I'm yeah, and that's for on-premise. So you'd put the file on a server and you can sync that as a repo and they'll be available to all. Um, but as for cloud, there's no planned right now integration with Git. The reason is we have so many other features we want to bring to the tool, even at, on a basic level like behaviors and stuff uh, that we're not there yet. So if you want it on-premise, there's actually a way to do it uh, using the server-side you know, script uh, um, saving mechanism. 
and then using building a repo outside of it, but there's nothing inside of script runner with Git. Yeah, we, we fought, or sorry, let me add something. Yeah. To it. So, so we thought of that too, but it's like actually like a security risk to have the uh, repo directly on the server. Uh, so that's why we uh, wanted to have like, or use some integration inside. So which is like more must, uh, so it's not like easy accessible yeah. No, have you tried thing behind you? Because like we are like doing it like we having the repo locally, uh, and we uh, make the changes in uh, in the console the inside Jira, uh, check that it's running, and and like also like push it to the master on Git, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get it. I mean, have you have you tried maybe um, you know marrying that file uh, outside of the system? So we've seen we've what I've seen is users will actually clone that and 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 what they'll do is basically every and it's it's a process but every day basically they grab what's in the master like what's in the actual file on the server they'll throw it somewhere else and that's where they get the repo and every day they'll go back and forth. Okay, I I have to look into it. But that's yeah, good. I mean it's it's not fun to do, but it's once it's set up, it works well. So every day you basically grab everything that's in the file, you copy it somewhere else that's secure and you do your, your, you know, you, you base your master on that. And then you can, you can use Git at that point and whatever is changed goes back every day as well. So it's a byte. So the sync goes both ways. Okay. I will check that. Thanks. I've, I've just, I've seen people do it. And honestly, I'm getting into the territory of, I wouldn't be the one setting it up. So <laughs> I'm not a sysadmin by trade. Uh, so doing, and, and not a, a, a Git admin either. So these are kind of foreign a little bit, but that's what I, I, I've seen other clients do. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Next question in the chat. Is it a fully featured Groovy or a subset? Can I import a library also? Where is this code executed? Okay. So good question. We actually execute the code us ourselves on our own stuff. Um, you run the code on our server and then we ping it back to Atlassian. That's the way it has to work. And as far as the groovy, you do get access to uh, everything that's groovy. Importing, um, you know, of course, importing libraries from outside is going to be a bit more difficult, but anything that's that's Groovy related and, and that's part of the Groovy uh, uh, kit, you'll be you'll be able to use. Yeah, should be able to do normal imports. I can't give you a, 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 a yes. All the imports are going to work just because I haven't tried them all. But so far, I've never run into a, any major problems. Okay. With important libraries. Um, I hope this answers the questions. Um, so the next one, do you provide a roadmap to customers even for six months ahead? So that would be, that would be crucial to know if we will be ready to move to the cloud. If, if that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend you reach us uh, at hello at adaptivist.com. Um, we don't have a public roadmap. Um, there are some things that we know that, and we can help you kind of understand what the timeline will look like. Um, but we, we don't have anything public, but if you want to reach out to us, you know, we can definitely share with you what we have, what I can tell you right now, um, that we're being quite open about is, is we have behaviors. They're, they're going to work. Um, right now we're on hold basically with Atlassian. As I said, Atlassian decides what they expose and what they don't. And so they gave us the APIs to make behaviors work but they haven't pushed it on production yet. So until that's that's available to us, we can't. Um, as soon as it's going to be there, I'm not going to say it's not one-to-one. -one. As soon as it's available, it's there. But we've worked on behaviors. They're ready for us to start putting them out there. Okay. Um, I have a follow-up question or a next question. How are you keeping regarding roadmap. So there's a lot of stuff happening with Jira, Jira, Jira service management, Jira DevOps, Jira, whatever. Um, so, uh, and all the different integrations and there's help and there isn't help and other stuff coming in. So um, how are you keeping up with all these changes? So if, you are, if we are talking about script runner for Jira, is that Jira classic or is it also Jira cherry, whatever service management? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
yeah so we're part of the developer community so we do have access to kind of an advanced news of things that are happening mostly everything's kind of built on the on underlying api that we have access to so for most of the stuff like when jsm's brought, brought on board and stuff like that um you know as long as it's an issue we can work with that um so unless they really change how the api behaves on a specific incident for example that could be a problem in the future and if it, it if it happens we'll know in advance and we'll make sure that it's it's corrected for when it's actually in production but yeah you're right it's it's ever evolving even our tool right if you buy a script runner for Jira Cloud, you'll get all the updates as they come. So like for whenever behavior comes out, you don't need to plan. Um, you don't need to plan for an upgrade. It's, it'll just be available to you when it comes out. Okay. Um, and here's a remark more than a question. Not having custom REST APIs could be a major headache as we have created them for integrations. Yeah. So it looks like we have to recreate all integrations with the REST provided from Atlassian. Yes, um, I understand that that pain point. Um, it's going to be there for sure. Like you said, though, th there are workarounds, which is just rethinking, you know, it's about mentality at that point more than about, you know, the technical aspects, which is uh, what I recommend usually is like, it's, you know, just like for a lot of people that are moving to the cloud, it's a good opportunity to sit down and look at what you have and what's used and what's not used and how it's used. And I mean, if the integration is integral to what you do, there's a good chance you'll be able to work around kind of making it work with what Atlassian has, but I understand the pain and uh, I I'm with you and we're definitely working to bring that into the fold. But right now it's not, it's not on the roadmap. Like, I mean, it's on the roadmap, meaning that it's a feature we'd like to add, but it's not going to be as soon as behaviors, for example. Okay. So um, you mentioned that you are executing the code on your, um, on your hardware or your services, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but as, if I understand it correctly, making it possible via your platform to integrate third party APIs is not on the map anywhere. So that would be a workaround. So if I execute the code on your platform anyway, you, I could call my API security and all that stuff notwithstanding, I could call the API from your platform and then somehow channel the result to Jira, whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna to try to answer this as good as I can <laughs> with what I have. You could always say this. I know, I know this is going on YouTube, so I gotta, I gotta check what I do because I yeah. know some people will see it. Um, if, you, if you want to call your lawyer, we can take a five. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that it's, you're bringing up a point that we understand what you're saying and we have thought of that. That's awesome. Okay. okay. So yeah. So great minds think alike. <laughs> that, that's the <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're definitely, yeah. Anyway, I, I can't say more than that. Okay. It's going to be an Perfect. exciting year. <laughs> yeah. So there have to be some big reveals left for the summit, right? So, um, can't, can't be happening. Everything cannot be happening. <laughs> front of the but that is a, is a very nice thing. Um, and there's another question. Do you plan to allow promotion of scripts into a reusable package like the bundle scripts? Yeah, kind of like what you have so for built in and stuff like that. Um, not not right now because we can't um, we it's, we don't have access to the the the, um, the canned um, everything like we used to in the. Uh, Wow, I wasn't prepared for that answer. Give me a second. Um, I <laughs> just I'm going to try to put it in my mind. So we don't have we can't allow you to store and actually dynamically reflect that code somewhere. I can't right now we can't, you know, give you custom fields that you fill out and that that will give you an output. So right now it's not on the on the roadmap per se, uh, but definitely something we, we we're looking into as well. Any feature that's on premise, I'll just say that as like a one answer for all these kind of questions. Like I understand it's a pain point. We all do honestly and we really want to make it as easy for you guys to jump on board with the cloud. And we're looking at everything to have feature parity, but because of the way that it works, it's difficult. Okay. Um, uh, that's that's now the GDPR question because we yeah. went into that <laughs> rabbit hole. Uh, code executed on adaptivist servers. Where are those loca located geographically? Are there zones like for you customers? It will execute closer to them. Same for North America. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, I know we have one in the UK. I 
think we have one in which the is US. not Europe anymore, unfortunately. But yeah, and yeah. So country. that's that's what I know so far. Um, yeah. I'd have to take it to the development team to see if we have we have opened up new servers and stuff. But so far, that's the information I got is is UK and um, but maybe you, US. Okay, but you do not have a concrete plan, for example, like uh, uh, for cloud enterprise to match the data residency feature, or uh, that something. Will be that will be offered third quarter for all so all of us. Yeah, all of all of the ad vendors right now are trying to figure out data residency as the same time as Atlassian is. I can tell you that if it's possible, it's definitely something we'll look into. Um, okay, you know, to map out if you're selecting, say Germany, that we'd be able to do Germany as well. We just gotta figure all that out internally. But to give a straight answer for right now, I know UK and probably US, but that's it. Okay, so. Outside. And I mean, it may, <laughs> I'd love to ping my development team and, and have an answer for you right now, but I, I, I can't. No, no, but, but, but the, the, the reasonable answer is probably outside of GDPR. So probably, yeah. Probably. So, and, and on the Atlassian roadmap, data residency for all tiers is, I think, Q, Q4 this year. So, yeah. So, a bit of a patience game waiting. Yeah. There. It's, I mean, uh, so, I'll, I'll just say that to like the whole cloud thing, right? That's happening and the move and, and server sunset, which is a thing. Um, we know that uh, this may be a little bit early for a lot of people to jump in the cloud. We understand that. Know that we have, we still have like three years, right? Until server is officially decommissioned. Things are going to change very quickly now. Things are going to happen every year. You're going to see a real step, like a huge step in the right direction for cloud. So what I answer today may actually be irrelevant even in a week because um, things change really fast right now. So all the, um, one of the things that was interesting is um, I think Atlassian and us vendors were very kind of, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but we, we noticed that there was a lot of ask for residency. That's the main thing. Where are we putting the data? So Everybody in the marketplace, everybody at Atlassian is aware of that as an issue. If currently you're saying, you know, this is not good for me, know that this is one of the major issues. It'll probably be worked out soon. Yeah. So what can't happen now, I can't tell you it's not going to happen in a week's time. Yeah. It's probably okay. going to happen fast. So the moral of the story is if we have to, when we have this talk again in a year from now, uh, the world will have taken a lot oh, more yeah. shape. So it will be a <laughs> lot, lot more clearer what it looks like. Yeah. And I, I think right now we're like in the beginning of this process, even though Atlassian has kind of asked for this to be kind of fast, we're still in the beginning of the process. And, you know, I, I don't know if you you were in the, you know, if you've been in Atlassian for a couple of years, you know, you we were all there at the infancy of cloud. It's not even close to what it is now. And back then it was, you know, quite, young um yeah. it has changed a lot in three years and i expect and then we give it another three years it's, it's going to be close to like 50 percent of its lifespan that's probably going to change a lot again okay so yeah 2015 five years so ago. yeah but the recommendation would be let all that stuff mature another year yeah. and yeah. Then, right now right now that's our our my go-to yeah. is is do what's right for you not not necessarily what you feel like you're being rushed into yeah. The truth is you have three years, which let's be realistic. It's, it's still a lot of time. Um, even if you were to plan a migration a year in advance, you still have two years before you plan that migration. Oh. So you have some time. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. That was very enlightening. Um, doesn't Thank really you for having make, me, by the way. Thank yeah, you. yeah. It doesn't really make us sleep better at night, but... Um, <laughs> I get it. But it's the information we have now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's the... the, the, it, it's the it, from, as you say, it's the information we have right now, and it still needs a bit of maturing. And if you are not... And that was a, was a great closing statement. If you, if you are not rushed to move to the cloud, uh, wait a bit. You have three years, and let's have yeah. this discussion again in a year, and uh, the world will... Yeah. Look and I mean, I mean, you know, it's it's still worth it to look into it and just seeing like what you can do. And like I said, it's a good moment. It's a good time right now to reassess the use of the tool, not just script runner, but just Jira in general. You know, yeah. if you're going to be moving, you know, it's definitely a good time to look into your processes and see if they map to what you need in the cloud. Um, so, yeah, yeah. We're, we're working hard to make it as painless as possible. Things are going to change quick. You'll see that we'll add features as we go. We've already grown the product, I feel, a ton in a year when I talk about Scribner for Jira Cloud. And okay. we'll keep we'll keep making sure that it, it keeps growing.
yeah, have a, a bon appetit, have a nice lunch. <laughs> um, and everybody else, wherever you are, have a nice day, night, whatever. And see you around next time. Good night. So, bye-bye. Thank you.